Well, since last time we talked, it doesn't look like the intensity of the hijab protest in Iran have changed much. Or actually, let me clarify. It doesn't look like the intensity of the good guy's side has changed much. Women are still taken to the streets a month later. On the bad guy's side, though, we've seen a steady increase in intensity. The Iran Human Rights Center, based in Oslo, estimates over 200 deaths. And unfortunately, none of those are cases of women wrapping flaming hijabs around members of the state morality police. But at the same time, we're also starting to see the first cracks in the Iranian government's armor. Former Speaker of the Iranian Parliament, Ali Larajani, a man The Guardian calls, quote, an impeccable establishment figure, end quote, has called for restraint and urged a rethinking of hijab requirements. Of course, that was in stark opposition to the message of Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, who has been uncompromising in his opposition to the protesters' demands. Now, granted, Supreme Leader is significantly more powerful than former Speaker of Parliament. I mean, it's Supreme Leader, so it's more powerful than any position, former or otherwise. But it means a lot that there is a clear conflict on the right way forward. In a state as repressive as Iran, just the fact that the political elites are discussing the matter, even to say no, is a big win and a move in the right direction. And I should emphasize here that it isn't just a matter of massive protest undermining the authority of the state. A lot of businesses have closed in solidarity with the protesters, and the government has been blacking out the Internet in an effort to stop the protesters from organizing. So this protest is really starting to impact the entire national economy in a way that the leaders can't ignore. So, you know, power to all involved, and if y'all need me to set anything on fire in solidarity, you just let me know. Of course, protests against institutionalized misogyny in the states are lower key for now, but they're still noteworthy. I was happy to see a nice little jiu-jitsu lawsuit by three Jewish women in Kentucky trying to use the Supreme Court's weaponized version of religious freedom against them. By their reckoning, since Jewish law supports reproductive rights and pretty much always has, they have a religious right to abortion access. And this marks at least the third similar suit filed by a Jewish group since the Dobbs decision took that right away. Now, I don't expect that they'll prevail. One of the Weasley ways the Supreme Court justified their overturning Roe versus Wade was by pretending that the opposition wasn't religiously motivated. But it may force the courts to highlight their own hypocrisy yet again by issuing another ruling admitting that the ever-expanding version of religious liberty that's so important to them in cases about school funding, coercive prayer, and public monuments only counts when the religion is Christian. And look, regardless, the idea that life begins at conception is a purely religious belief. The only way to get there is through faith, because it sure as hell isn't supported by science. So regardless of what the court's willing to admit, the constitutional amendment Kentuckians are set to enact next month, which is entirely based on that religious belief, is a case of Christian privilege. So the lawsuit kind of highlights that hypocrisy one way or the other. And with those slightly positive stories amid such a negative background, I'll wrap things up and hand you back over to Noah, Heath, and Eli.